about to leave Already packing, come with me I'm not really asking We'll get away to a place where we don't know About to see the world in action What we can be, life with no distractions We'll get away, this is what we waited for Evening all, welcome to our 10th GCSE Geography Live revision stream for this term. And uh, well, we've made almost made it, haven't we, to the end of term. Amazing yeah. stuff. And uh, mm. two familiar faces joining me tonight. We've got Vicky and Suzanne. Good evening, team. Hi. Hello. <laughs> uh, it's unbelievable, isn't it? I can't believe how many we've done, how many sessions we've done. How, how yeah. It seems like it's been really quick, but actually it's been a long old term, hasn't it? And students have worked so hard. Yeah, to really so long. Hard. We're almost there, and we're going to finish off with a seven-hour session on. Um, are we only kidding? <laughs> only seven. Well, it, yeah, yeah. It, it could be if we don't if we don't crack on resource challenges <laughs> in the UK. So, uh, I'll, Vicky, I'll let you. I think you're introducing tonight. I'll let you crack on just to say if anyone's watching live, if anyone, I can see people watching live. Yeah. Uh, welcome to you. Um, if you're watching on Catch, Catch Up and Replay, as Vicky and Suzanne will mention during the session, please do take the time. Pause the video if you want to give yourself a bit more time to have a go at the activities. You might be doing them in class as part of revision, uh, but however you're doing it, uh, give it a go. And uh, there's some cracking content in today's session, as always. Some nice recaps on the key topics, some exam advice. So don't forget, if you go to choose2t.net forward slash live at the end of this session, not before, uh, <laughs> go check out all of Vicky and Suzanne and the team's uh, other sessions. You can download all, download all the slides watch all the videos it's all there so don't feel as though you don't have to write loads of notes tonight that's that's it for me vicky suzanne should we, okay. should we crack on vicky lead us off 
So we are looking tonight at resource management in the UK. So obviously, if you do resource management, your school will either choose food, water or energy, sort of to look at a global perspective. But you do have to have a UK overview to begin with. So that is what we are going to cover this evening. Um, so we're going to start off tonight with a festive 60 second challenge. And all of our um, quizzes tonight are festive. So hopefully that will make you feel a little bit Christmassy as we drag our heels towards the end of the term. So you need to match your key terms and definitions you just need to pop the uh, correct numbers and letters into the chat window so Jim can we have the 60 second timer um, going please so we have food files, organic produce, water stress, water transfer, energy mix and energy security which definitions with those key terms so if you pop the letter and the number into the chat Okay, so lovely all the Christmas a festive hit there. I'm not sure whether that's been a Christmas number one at any point. Certainly one that I've not heard out of the uh, realms of tutor for you. So we have some answers coming up in the chat window. Let's have a look if you are correct. So we have every answer correct. Well done, Tony. Excellent work there. So food miles. This is a distance covered supplying food to customers from field to fork, as it's often known as. Obviously, the further your food travels, the bigger impact it has on the uh, planet, which we're going to talk about a bit later. Organic produce, a food produced without the use of chemicals, e.g. fertilizers and pesticides. Again, all of these things we're going to talk about a bit later. Water stress is when the demand for water exceeds supply in a certain period or when poor quality restricts the use. So some of you might remember a few years ago, South Africa had a day zero where they were expecting to run out of water and taps were running dry in Cape Town. Um, water transfer, matching supply with demand by moving water from an area with water surplus to another experience of water deficit. So if you do the water um, option, you will have looked at a water transfer scheme. And certainly we do have some water transfer schemes in the north of England in this country. Energy mix is a range of energy sources of a regional country, both renewable and non-renewable. This changes all the time, and we'll talk about this a bit later. And then energy security, un uninterrupted availability of energy sources at an affordable price. Now, you possibly have also come across the terms water security and food security as well, just making sure that everybody has enough of those things that we need. And obviously, if you have energy insecurity, it means that we do not have that. So I'm going to hand over to Suzanne really quickly to just, cut, just talk to you about what we're going to cover today. Thank you. Right. So as Vicky has been talking about, we have to have an overview of both food, water and energy in the UK before you then start to specialise in one of those um, areas. So food, what we're going to be looking at is the overall demand in the UK and how it's increased particularly trends for eating um, certain types of food and particularly food all year round. So I'm sure lots of you will be tucking into some sort of tropical fruits, maybe like strawberries or berries at Christmas. Um, but we'll also be looking at where these come from, um, link to their the food miles that they, um, that they have and their carbon footprint. Um, we'll be linking that with um, some agribusinesses and looking at farming on an industrial scale. Um, we're also look, going to be looking at the increasing need to kind of have UK food security um, and that's going to be quite important. Interestingly, this has become an issue very recently, but actually it's not really linked to the lack of food being produced. It's actually been linked to the supply chain. So problems with lorry drivers um, and, and not being able to get the um, food to the shops. So it actually has begun to expose our reliance on overseas produce because we've had some um, 
there's problems with the supply chain and actually getting the food to us. We're also going to be looking at water. So you can see there the changing demands for water, particularly looking at increases in recent decades, although we are beginning to level out in some cases. Um, you also need to know about water quality and pollution which again is going to be very relevant as there's been quite a lot of recent political tensions as was a vote very recently to allow more sewage to be released into british rivers and to seas when it can't be treated quickly enough on site um, and we're also going to look at some of the issues of supply and demand so increasing dependency of drier areas of the uk with large populations and high um a high population density with um, and comparing that with areas with lots of supply where they have high rainfall but low population densities and finally we'll be touching on energy so the energy mix that um was just in that multiple choice um sorry the the, the um, matching quiz just a minute ago um the combination those are the combination of fuel types that we use in the uk um, we'll be looking at our reliance on those fossil fuels um and the impact that has and also the increase in alternative green energies, so things like solar panels and wind farms. And you'll need to be looking at the economic and environmental issues caused by any type of resource exploitation of energy, either by non-renewable or by renewable. Right, and I think that really covers everything that we're going to be looking at. Excellent. Thank you very much. So firstly, we're going to start looking at the changing demand of food. So the UK population is currently about 68.4 million people. So it's up from 66 million in 2017. So it's growing quickly. And we are expected to hit about 73 million in the next 15 years. So we know that this continued population growth will increase future demand for food. But we also know from what Suzanne has just said that the UK is not self-sufficient for food at all, despite the fact that we are efficient in our agriculture and we are very productive. We import around about 40% of our food from other countries and there are lots of different reasons for why we import so much food. So we demand that greater choice and we demand more exotic food. So we know, you know, we, we're not you know, gone are the days where we were happy with meat and two veg and a really sort of bland diet that perhaps parents and grandparents might have had. Um, we also like that seasonal produce all year round. So we want blueberries all year round, strawberries. We don't want just to have them in July or, you know, June, July when we can actually grow strawberries in our country. Um, we also have food that we actually, um, you know, food and other produce that we cannot grow in our country because of our climate. So cocoa, tea, coffee, bananas, etc. So supermarkets compete for the lowest prices as well. So this saves lots of money because they can import cheaper produce. It's much cheaper that for them to import from other countries than it is to actually um buy goods that are being produced in the UK. And as a result, UK farmers really struggle to compete with these low prices, particularly when they have to factor in the additional costs like animal feed, or perhaps the risk of a poor harvest if we've had a really dry year or it's been very wet, for example. Jim, can I have the next slide up, please? Excellent. So there is a huge impact of importing food. So obviously a really good impact of importing food is the fact that it does give us a reasonably secure um, food supply and it gives us a much greater choice of products. But there are some really negative impacts of importing food as well. So we did mention um, food miles and carbon footprint um, in the first task. So we're going to talk about this in this section. So one of the biggest impacts of importing food is the emissions that are giving off during production and transportation. So that carbon dioxide, which obviously contributes towards climate change. And we know that this is something that we need to obviously bring down, particularly with the recent COP26 agreements that have um, come to light. So the distance that your food travels from, from is uh, from field to fork is known as food miles, like I mentioned earlier. And the greater these are, the bigger the impact on the planet. So if we think about some of those things that we import, bananas coming from the Caribbean are actually traveling about five and a half thousand miles to reach us. Spanish strawberries are coming um, about one, 1 1.5 kilometers, sorry, 1.5 thousand kilometers, not 1.5 kilometers, that'd be very impressive. Um, blueberries from the USA are traveling over 5,000 kilometers. And then we think of even even further afield. So we get lots of apples from South Africa. These travel nearly 10,000 kilometres to get to us. And New Zealand lamb travels about 18,800 kilometres. So a really long way 
And these food miles are leading to a much higher carbon footprint, which is the amount of CO2 emissions given off during commercial cultivation and transporting that produce. And of course, transporting produce itself is really, really expensive. You factor in sort of the distance it's traveling, but also having to refrigerate everything on the way. Although it does tend to be less expensive than producing everything in the UK. Can we have the next slide up, please, Jim? So we did talk about how, as a country, we are not food secure. So we have a much, much greater need for food security. And obviously, as we have more and more people coming into the country, so um, and the population growing through obviously migration, but also natural increase, then we are going to need to have even more feed and food for all of those mouths to feed. So there is a concern about the UK's dependency on food imports and the need for greater food security. And obviously, we, like Suzanne said, we've seen this a lot over the last few months of empty shelves in the supermarkets, all related to that sort of supply chain issues. Um, as a result, more people are trying to source their food locally to reduce food miles, but also carbon emissions. So people are thinking about food security, but they're also thinking about the impact that their diet has on the planet. We are being encouraged to eat those seasonal foods produced in the UK. And in recent years, we've seen the growth of organic produce, but also agribusiness. So two really, really different things. So organic produce is grown without the use of chemicals. There are no fertilizers. There are no pesticides there. And the lack of chemicals does mean that organic food has a higher cost and a lower yield. So it does make it more expensive overall. So it's one of those things that not everybody in the country can afford to embrace. Um, and it is usually brought locally and it is usually seasonal. So on the complete flip side is agribusiness. And there's a photograph of agribusiness on the screen in front of you. So really intensive farming maximizes the amount of goods uh, produced by using modern technology. So for example, there might be a really expensive irrigation system inside and lots of chemicals to increase those yields. And farms are run as huge commercial businesses. So two really different things. Okay, kind of that food security is uh, one of the agribusiness is one of those things that is going to help us sort of increase our food security. But obviously, it does have a cost to the environment. Jim, can we have the, uh, the next task up, please? So we are going to do a cracker the code activity. So I would like you to put these imports in order of food miles, i.e. those travel the furthest first. So it's a little bit of thinking about you know, picturing where these countries are on the map, on the world map. How far are they from the UK? So I'm going to give you a few moments. I'm not sure if we get a countdown on this um, activity or not. Do we get a countdown on this, Jim? No countdown on this. Just waiting okay. for the correct answer. Super. OK, so if we I'll give you a few moments to pop the correct um, order into the chat window. Off you go. So we've got beans from Kenya, mangoes from Brazil, beef from Argentina, lamb from New Zealand, prawns from Thailand and bananas from Dominica, which is in the Caribbean, if we are not sure about that one. OK, off you go. I'm going to give you a few moments. If you are watching on Catch Up, then I would pause now and give yourself as much time as you need. OK. So where do we think? One of them should be fairly obvious to get us started. And certainly we have mentioned one of those. OK, I'm going to give you a couple of more moments. OK, so we've got an answer coming up in the chat window. Let's have a look and see whether you are correct. So D E C B F A. Jim, can we have the answer on the screen and see whether that is the right answer? Uh, almost. So not quite. We've got a couple the wrong way around there. So <clears throat> Jim, I think we've got another side for this activity, haven't we? So our uh, lamb from New Zealand travels the furthest. Then we have beef from Argentina, prawns from Thailand, mangoes from Brazil beans from Kenya and bananas from Dominica. I think I might have myself got Argentina and Thailand slightly the wrong way around there. But excellent. A really good effort. Well done for those of you who attempted to guess that. OK, I'm going to hand over to Susanna, who's going to talk to you about water. Thank you, Vicky. Right. OK, so we're thinking about our water in the UK and you can see that it says that almost half of the UK's water supply is actually for domestic use. So that's things that we use in our homes. But if, um, a fifth of it is wasted through leakage and actually per day we're losing about three billion litres of water, which is the equivalent. I don't know why they do it. It's 2200 Olympic swimming pools. I can't quite imagine in my head what they look like. But that's a lot of swimming pools and a lot of water and that's every single day. 
The demand for water in the UK is actually increasing due to our growing population. So we're increasing by about 360,000 people per year. It's about 0.5%. It's not an enormous amount, but it's enough for more homes to be built. And actually, we also have some sort of um, societal changes like changing family structures, which are resulting in more households. So you may even think that this might be you one day when you're a young adult, you might want to actually move out of the family home and get yourself a nice apartment or a flat rather than staying at home um, with the family forevermore. And that means obviously we're getting or buying a lot more water uh, water appliances or water intensive domestic appliances it says there so um we've got you know dishwashers and washing machines and it's likely that you know people living on their own and and or living in you know only a few people in a house probably set those off both the washing machine and the dishwasher when they're not fully um not full, completely full so they're going to be using excess water in those um and it's estimated that per person we're, we're using about 150 litres a day. Um, maybe you can have a think and and um, kind of try to consider how many ways you've used water today and whether you think you've reached your 150 litres. It's certainly not just what you drink, it's what you use when you're brushing your teeth, when you're having a shower, what what is being used to wash your clothes, cook your food and so on. Right, can I have the next slide? Thank you, um, Jim. Right, we do actually receive enough rainfall. So we are a relatively wet country, but unfortunately it's not always in the areas where we need it. So it's not falling where it's most needed. Now we have some areas which are in water surplus and that means the water supply, so the rainfall exceeds the demand in the area. So how much is needed in that location? So example there is both the north and the west of the UK. They actually have really high rainfall totals. So somewhere like North Wales, for instance, it's got about 1,100 millimetres annually. Um, and we can compare that with Suffolk in um, eastern England, where we've got only 592 millimetres. So not, you know, sort of a, not quite half, but it's considerably lower. Um, and that um, links in with these areas of water deficit. So the east and the south of the UK um, do have much lower rainfall totals. And I actually found Kew Gardens in London, you think the population density in London is very, very high. Um, they only get 622 millimetres a year um, of, of rainfall there. So there are these areas where there is huge demand because there's really high population density, but actually the supply is relatively low. Um, could I have the next slide, please, Jim? So there are questions about how do we manage our water supply? Because we've clearly, we, we've got enough, but it's not in the right place. But also what do we do in the places where um, we don't have enough and where demand exceeds supply and we're in water deficit? So we can manage our water better. And the first thing we can do is save water. Now, I'm sure lots of you have had sort of information when you're in primary school and we carry on looking at ways to save water when we're you know, in secondary school with kind of things that you pop in the toilet and you might even have been given some little timers to pop on the shower so that you're only in there for two minutes or brushing your teeth and turning the tap off. There's lots of different strategies that we're often told about to help save some of our water. But one thing that the water companies have done is actually install domestic water meters. Now, this actually tells you how much water you're using. It monitors it. So it doesn't actually stop you from using water, but what it does do is it makes people much more aware of the cost of water and because they know they're paying for every single litre that they use, they perhaps get a little bit more careful about what they're using and they are going to turn off taps because if you leave a tap running, it's going to cost you money. Um, we can also use recycled water and we sometimes call that grey water. And you can see that it says good for irrigation. So we can use it to water plants in the garden. Um, and we get our grey water from maybe shower water, bath water, stuff we've used in the kitchen, maybe the washing machine water um, that's been on the sort of the, the last uh, cycle. But we do need to be quite careful with contaminants there because they can often, if we've, if we've been using some quite harsh chemicals or kind of um, 
uh, sort of fabric um, softeners or, or um, what's the word, washing liquid, it, it can actually not be very good for uh, the plant. So we have to be careful there. Um, and the last one there is investing in efficient domestic appliances. So now whenever you go to buy a new appliance, they will all be rated. So there will be big stickers on them. Um, and you can get like A star star, uh, not sorry, A plus plus, A plus, A, B, C, D. And they're talking about their sort of water efficiency as well as energy efficiencies. We have both of those things going on now. Right, if I could have the next slide, please, Jim. Thank you. So one of the possible solutions to this problem of water deficit, these areas that don't have enough water but are really high demand, is we need to transfer the water. So we need a, a way of getting it from the location where we've got plenty of it to the location where it's needed. And as you can see there, we've got an example of Kilda Water in Northumberland. Now that was a hugely expensive um, project, which was also multi-purpose. So not only did it um, transfer the water from uh, where it was needed to places within the northeast that were in deficit but it also provided uh, hydroelectric power and also lots of recreation on the reservoir that was created however today there's quite a lot of questions over whether something that large could really ever be built again it was seen as ex extremely ambitious and there's a kind of question mark so whether we would ever really be able to get that through planning in the future and also there were quite a lot of controversial impacts um, as a result of it and one of the big ones was the impact on river habitats because you're mixing waters from different areas so the pHs can be different um, and the kind of aquatic life and, and there were issues there it was obviously ex extremely expensive and there is quite a, a a carbon cost of pumping all of that water over the long distances required. Okay, if I could go into the next one, please. So um, having enough water isn't the full picture, though. Um, it's also about the water quality. So there's no point in having loads of water which is polluted or contaminated. So it's actually the Environment Agency's job to try to manage the water quality. And it does that in a number of ways. So you can see there that it regularly monitors river water quality. So they have people going out, it might be an interesting job or career you could have a look at. So they go out and they take samples and they measure the water and they look at the pH and they look at any other um, sort of minerals that might be in the water. Um, they also remove sediment by filtering through the water and they can add chlorine to purify water. Particularly they do this when they're treating water um, to send back in um, to, for domestic use. They can also place restrictions on some of the recreational uses in the in the areas uh, where they have their water sources, so like the reservoirs. So they can ban power, power boats because obviously they can cause pollution and um, reduce the water quality. There's also some quite strict regulations on water use. So um, some places you can't use too much or abstract too much, particularly agriculture. And they impose fines on people who pollute water sources. Now that can be on industry, but unfortunately it could also be on the very people who are also meant to be providing us with water. So you can see there, Southern Water. Now there's a big sewage stand scandal this year where they were actually fined £90 million in July of this year. Um, because they had uh, racked up almost 7,000 incidents of discharging sewage into the waterways in southern England. Um, they were accused at the time of avoiding the costs of actually spending money on recycling of sewage and also upgrading their sewage treatment facilities. And many argued that the, the way the water company had acted, they had seen it as cheaper to risk it hope they didn't get caught and if they did they'd pay the fine because that was cheaper than actually improving their systems. Um, 10,000 oysters were contaminated in the oyster beds just off the coastline um, and that went into the food chain so it made some people quite poorly and also there was quite significant damage to wildlife and sea life in the areas that had been affected. 
Right, you can see there on the second um, column, pollution can also deteriorate the groundwater sources. Now, the groundwater sources is water found on the ground in cracks and spaces in the soil, the sand and the rocks. And you can see there we can have chemicals which might leak down in, from, from places like old underground mines. Um, they can leach down into those um, uh, groundwater sources and then into the waterways. We also have industrial sites which are known to discharge waste into waterways. They're not meant to but sometimes it happens by accident. Sometimes it might be a deliberate um, sort of um, release in order to just save money on or, or not not to have to deal with the waste themselves. Um, we also have quite a lot of problems with chemical fertilizers used in farming. Um, which when it rains they often wash out off up wash off into the rivers um, and they can cause all sorts of damage and changes in the water. You may have heard the term eutrophication, um, which is um, caused by those fertilisers. And we have finally their power stations. Now they can often use water in the cooling process, but then they release it back into the waterway. And the problem there is that they're different temperatures and it can have a really damaging effect on some of the wildlife. You know, one minute they're swimming along in uh, very very cool water in the next minute it's it's boiling so it can be quite um quite negative um impacts on wildlife right i think we are now going to play oh i'm really excited about this one so this is rudolph's odd one out so what you need to do here is um you need to yeah it's just like our, our normal odd ones out you're going to see four items and you've got to decide which one's the odd one out and what connects the other three so here we go we have got here oh, um showering for a b flushing toilets c for manufacturing or d washing clothes so which one of those four do you think you uh, think which rudolph might be the odd one out and what do you think links the other three that are left so if you want to put into the chat box if you're playing live here with us tonight if you're not you can just pop it down on a piece of paper you can pause it if you need to look a little bit more right am i going to have anyone coming through i've got a bit of a lag tonight but hopefully someone will give me an a b c or a d yes thank you vicky yeah maybe think about where they take place so where are they taking place those things Right, should we have a look at the answer? Oh, yes, we've got here, C, brilliant, manufacturing. Well done, Tony. Right, so the other three, the link between them is they are the domestic uses of water. So they're the water that we're using in our own homes, whereas we don't use water for manufacturing in our own homes. Right, let's go for question number two, please. Fab, right, so this one, you've got to find which Rudos the odd one out. Is it A, growing population, B, water conservation, C, more homes being built, or D, the increase in water intensive appliances. Hopefully this one will stand out instantly for you. Which one do you think is the odd one out? Maybe see if you can work out what links the other three. I'm going to leave it go. Let's see if we've got any of our watchers. A, B, C or D. Right, let's give it a go and a reveal, please, Jim. So, of course, it is water conservation is the odd one out because all the other three answers are why the UK demand for water is increasing. If you remember, I talked to you about the population growing, about us having more homes and also us having lots more um, water intensive appliances like washing machines and dishwashers. Right, let's do Rudolph number three. Wonderful. Right, so this one here, we've got A, buy more efficient appliances, B, install water meters, C, use recycled or grey water, D, have baths instead of showers. Now, I think this one's quite an easy one, so hopefully you'll be able to see the answer to this one straight away. Which one of those is the odd one out and what links the other three? Let's have a look. Right. I'm afraid I'm very laggy tonight, so I can't see any answers coming up yet. I'm sure they are there. Um, shall we have a reveal, please, Jim? Absolutely. So 
baths instead of showers that's a dreadful way to save water you're definitely not going to be saving water by having baths instead of showers um so the other three are ways to save water whereas d is the opposite it's ways to perhaps use more water than you need to for cleaning yourself although to be fair a nice bubble bath is nice isn't it right number four um which one's the odd one out here so a we've got more reliable supply to areas of water deficit b very expensive c carbon dioxide is released in the pumping process and d impacts on river habitats so what do you reckon here Oh, I've just seen. Well done, Tony. <laughs> what do you reckon here for number four? What are we going to go with? A, B, C or D, Rudolph? Mm. Okay, come on, Jim, let's have a look. Absolutely. Yeah, so this one here is the odd one out, Rudolph, is A. So more reliable supply to areas of deficit was actually an advantage where all the others were arguments against water transfer schemes. Remember the killed water, it was very expensive, lots of carbon dioxide pumping the water from one place to another and really negative on river, negative impact on river habitats. Right. OK, I think we've got, is this the final one? I think it might be. Um, yeah, it is the last one. Yeah, <laughs> we've got another four rudders. I love this so much. I think I could play forever. Um, right, industrial discharge for A, B, fertilizer runoff, C, imposed fines, or D, chemicals from old mine works. Which one of those do you think is the odd one out? And which one do you think, or what do you think uh, links the other three? Let's see if I get some answers. And if you're playing at home or on catch up, you can obviously pause it and stop and have a think about what some of those mean. Right, Jim, shall we see which Rudolph it is? Yeah, it's C, impose fines. Because the other three are the sources of water pollution, where obviously C is what we do um, when we find out someone has polluted. So it's kind of a consequence, a negative consequence to them. Right, I think that's me done with Rudolph. So I shall pass <laughs> over, over to Vicky. Excellent. So we're going to finish off by whizzing through um, the energy aspect of the UK resources before we do a little bit of exam gold. So there is also a change in demand for energy, just as there is a change in demand for water and for food like we've already discussed. So despite increasing demand for electricity in the UK, actually, our energy consumption has fallen in recent years. And this is due mainly to the decline of heavy industry which we've talked about in previous sessions and improved energy conservation again always striving for those sort of you know to lower those emissions so we're thinking about low energy appliances better building insulation and more fuel efficient cars and this has all resulted in around about 60 percent fall in energy use by industry and about a 12 percent fall in domestic energy use which obviously is a really good thing but our energy mix has also changed so remember we talked about this being the range and proportions of different energy sources that we're using. So in the 1990s or in 1990, three quarters of our energy came from coal and oil, which we know are fossil fuels. And in 2007, we saw that there was an equal mix of coal, gas and nuclear. So sort of definitely during the 1990s, there was a real rollout of nuclear power stations across the country. And since uh, 2014, we've seen much more renewable sources growing fast. Currently, the government is aiming for about 15% of energy source from those renewable sources, mainly, in fact, from um, offshore wind farms at the moment. Although surprisingly, they've decided to phase out subsidies for wind and solar energy, despite the fact that they do have this target. And obviously, this target would be really good for meeting those COP26 targets that we've talked about as well. Jim, can I have the next slide up, please? So we have talked about food security, we've talked about water security, and we have got energy security to consider this time. So this is the uninterrupted availability of energy sources at an affordable price. And the UK is no longer self-sufficient in terms of energy. So around about three quarters of the UK's reserves of oil and natural gas have been exhausted and we import around about a third of our energy sources from other countries which obviously does affect our energy security because we are at the mercy of changing ever-changing prices around the world if we are involved in some sort of conflict then obviously um, certain countries can threaten to withdraw energy supplies from us so in the past Russia have said that they're going to stop um, 
they're going to stop gas supplies from Russia into the UK, which is obviously something that we would be very concerned about as a country. Um, so particularly at times of low supply, prices do tend to rocket. We do have lots of gas and oil reserves left, but they do tend to be in really hard to access places. So, for example, you've got the Mariner oil field um, just off the coast of Scotland. I say off the coast of Scotland. It's actually 150 kilometres from the Shetland. So it is really, really remote. And as a result, oil production has declined by around about 6% every year for the last decade. So that's a huge drop. We also have really rich reserves of natural gas trapped deep underground in shale rocks. This is something that has become more well known over the last um, decade or so. In order to extract that gas, we use high pressure liquid, which is kind of a mixture of water, sand and other chemicals. And this is used to fracture the shale, which then releases the gas. This process is called fracking, which you possibly have heard of, but it is highly controversial. There are all sorts of worries that people have about fracking, that it could trigger earthquakes. It could pollute underground water sources where we obviously get old drinking water from. But it is also very, very expensive. Jim, can I have the final slide up for energy? Thank you. So we've also seen the decline of coal. So we know that there are that greenhouse gases um, is that's a real sort of concern when we talk about old coal fired power stations. And they were a real mainstay of the UK, particularly in those sort of northern parts of the UK and obviously in um, southern Wales as well. So along with the decline of heavy industry, we've had a steady decline in coal, particularly from sort of the 1980s onwards. But we do still have several decades of fossil fuels left in the country and they are still used in power stations. The government is currently saying that these power stations will all close by 2025, so four years time. But we are still importing quite a lot of coal cheaply. So three quarters of the coal that we actually use in the country does come from the USA. It comes from Russia and Colombia. So at the moment, this is something that we're not particularly expecting to, to stop at any point. Jim, can I have the next slide, please? So I did fib to you a minute ago. I said that was the last slide on energy, but no, we've got one more. So again, when we're thinking about these, um, when we're thinking about food, water and energy, Suzanne said earlier that you always need to understand the impacts of the exploitation or the production or whatever, you, you know, whichever, depending on whichever um, one of the resources you're talking about. So there are lots of economic and environmental um, impacts of various energy sources. So on the screen, we have two different ones, which we have seen more and more in the last um, couple of decades. So nuclear, for example, we start off with nuclear power. Nuclear power is seen as a relatively green alternative because it does not give off many emissions compared to other non-renewable sources. So it doesn't give off the amount of emissions that you would expect with fossil fuel burning, so oil, gas and coal. Um, However, it is really expensive to build and it does cost a lot to produce that electricity in the first place. And at the end of the, the power station life, which is generally 40 to 50 years, decommissioning that power station is incredibly expensive. So they cost millions and millions of pounds to close down because obviously you've got to make them safe. So decommissioning is all about sort of removing that radioactive element of the nuclear power station. But they do create lots of jobs and they boost the local economies when they have new plants. Um, they, like I said, they, they do give off lots of you know, far less emissions than other renewables. But processing and storing is really difficult. There is a potential for toxic or radioactive spills. So many people fear nuclear power station. But you've also got that warm wastewater impacting rivers and habitats. I actually grew up near a nuclear power station and the sea was always quite warm. So it's quite pleasant for learning to swim as a child. But um, when I was sort of five or six, I wasn't really, uh, didn't really understand why the sea was so um, so warm. I'm less inclined to swim there nowadays. Um, if we then think about wind farms, which again is something that we see, if you live by the coast, you will have seen these popping up everywhere. Now, wind farms are really, really um, popular in terms of a green, eco-friendly way to um, produce energy. They are very expensive to build. They could deter like, to tourists, but they like, potentially could harm the local economy. Although, actually, I think they personally look quite nice. So they could become a visitor attraction and they can lead to lower energy bills locally. On the, on top of that, you've also got areas where the wind farms are 
currently, which are building massive economies right around wind farm generation, sort of wind power generation. So particularly on the east coast, in places like Yorkshire and Lincolnshire, they've got all sorts of money and investment coming in because of offshore wind. They also have so they have that big visual impact on the landscape. So you get quite a lot of opposition from locals for this reason, but opposition from locals in terms of noise. But we do know that they reduce greenhouse gases and the carbon footprint, but there is an impact on wildlife. So birds do have a tendency to fly into these wind turbines occasionally, and obviously that will be the last thing that bird does. Um, can I have the quiz up now, please, Jim? Excellent. So we've got a bauble quiz, okay? So the number of answers that are correct can range from zero to all four. So let's have a look at the first one. So why has the UK demand for energy decreased? what do we think might be the correct answer? So if you pop in the chat window, the letters that you think are um, an answer for that question. So we've got population growth, new homes are being built, decline of heavy industry, better insulation. So if you are watching on catch up, you can pause to give yourself a couple of more moments. Just give you a moment if you're watching live and you're joining in. Okay, Jim, can we have the correct ones on X? So the decline of heavy industry, better insulation both of these are reasons why energy has decreased okay number two well done tony for getting those correct so which of these energy sources are non-renewable oil nuclear coal gas okay so again pop the letters that are correct into the chat window oil nuclear coal or gas which of these are non-renewable i'm just going to give you a couple of moments again if you're watching on catch up then you can pause Okay, so we've got a couple of answers coming through. Yep. So we've got B, absolutely, definitely not renewable. Any others? Okay, let's have a look. Super. They are all non-renewable sources. Okay, even nuclear. Though nuclear gives off far less, it is non-renewable. Okay, third question, please, Jim. Which of these countries do we import coal from? Colombia, Russia, Indonesia, USA. If you were listening carefully, I did mention these countries that we get our coal from. We get them from other countries as well, but these are our main importers. So Colombia, Russia, Indonesia, or the USA. Again, if you're watching on catch up, pause the video for a moment. Okay, I'm gonna give you watch people watching live just a moment. Okay, so we've got Colombia in the chat window. Any others? Okay, Jim, can we reveal? Excellent. So we get we import coal from Colombia, Russia, USA, but not Indonesia. OK, next question, please. So which of these are associated with fracking and its expensive extraction process, the possibility of earthquakes, fewer emissions in traditional sources and the pollution of groundwater? OK, so what do we think? So A, B, C or D. Again, if you're watching on catch up, then pause for a few moments. Okay, Jim, can we have the answers on the screen, please? Excellent. It's an expensive extraction process, the possibility of earthquakes and the pollution of groundwater. Super. There will be just as many emissions because it will be burnt. So which of these are associated with wind farms? Risk to birds, the decommissioning process, which should not have that extra E on it. I apologise for that. Visual impact on the landscape and wastewater going into habitats. Okay, so which ones of those are associated with wind farms? Okay, if you can just pause if you're watching on catch up. So we've got A and C coming into the chat window. Let's see if you're right, Tony. Well done. Excellent work. Thank you very much. So I'm going to hand over to Suzanne for some really quick exam gold. Wonderful. OK, so we're going to have a look at this four mark question. So suggest why the UK's energy mix is continuously changing. So obviously what we've got there is the command word suggest. So that's give plausible reasons. Um, and the energy mix, as we've looked at before, is the kind of the proportions of different types of energy where um, which is providing the UK with what we're using. Um, and we're looking at why that's continuously changing. So if I can just have a look at the next slide, please. Thank you. So what we need to consider in a response to this question is considering both long term and short term changes in energy mix. So looking at the long term changes, we need to kind of link this to our understanding so far. 
And as we've talked about tonight, we know that we have a commitment in the UK to try to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. And we have agreed to decommission some of those coal fire power stations. The date, as Vicky said, 2025, but whether that really happens is, is kind of a bit of a question mark, because coal is actually one of the most polluting of all the, all the fossil fuels. That's probably the worst in terms of its emissions and, and certainly particulate matter. And many of the discussions around carbon emissions became highly publicised through the COP26 um, very recently. So we've perhaps heard a little bit more about this um, reduction in um, carbon emissions and switching from um, fossil fuels to um, more renewables. Um, they are very difficult decisions to make because they have to be offset against economic growth. But back to the question. So first of all, you will be talking. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Jim. I'm still on. I need to do short term first. So we you need to make sure that you've put into your answer something about um, decommissioning um, those coal fired power stations and shifting from fossil fuel energy production into looking at increasing the amount of renewables. Now, the short term um, energy mix changes because we do change from every day. And, you know, one day we might have a certain percentage of solar power and the next day it might go down. And that was very dependent on the weather because some of our renewables like um, wind power and the wind turbines and solar panels are dependent on the kind of weather that we receive. So that can alter day to day changes. And it might be that we need to top up using a different source, maybe nuclear or maybe gas fired power station when wind speeds are very low or when it's quite gloomy and the solar panels can't operate. Right, if we can just look at the final um, slide, thank you. So looking at this four marker, you need to think about offering the examiner two ideas which are developed fully. And as we saw in the previous slide, you can have one of those ideas about long term changes and one about short term changes. So you'd make your point and then you would make sure you elaborate it. So start off by talking about those climate change um, targets and the requirement for us and our agreement that we've made with lots of other countries to decrease our emissions. And we have said we will do this by having less reliance on fossil fuels. Um, because we know that they have a significantly negative environmental impact. So in the long term, we are expecting to see a change in our energy mix as we move away from those fossil fuels to those renewables. Then for the second point, and fully developed point, we would talk about the reliability of those renewable sources. So the fact that they are dependent on weather conditions, which can change from day to day, week to week, from season to season. So wind tur turbines can generate much more energy at certain times of the year, as do, do solar panels. So we mentioned in our second developed point that um, the the issues of actually being able to use renewable sources all year round and they're not as reliable at the moment as perhaps we would like. Right, I think that concludes the exam gold and I think you're on to a final uh, Christmas present blast of MCQs. Excellent. Excellent, we're going to whiz through these as we are running over slightly. So we have got five MCQs. Uh, which of the Christmas presents contains the correct answer? So in 2016, how much of the UK's primary energy supply came from renewable energy? What do we think this might be? So I'm going to give you a couple of moments. If you're watching on Catch Up, you might want to pause. So what do we think the answer is here? Is it 7, 17, um, 57 or 67? in 2016. Okay, Jim, what is the answer? 17%. Excellent. Well done, those, who, those of you who got that correct. Okay, number two. In which sea does the UK have large reserves of oil and gas? So the English Channel, the Irish Sea, the Celtic Sea or the North Sea? A, B, C or D? What do we think? OK, so if you can pause it if you're watching on Catch Up to give you a little bit more time. We've got the North Sea coming up in the chat window. Let's see if you are correct. Well done, Tony. That is the correct answer. So question three. Identify the main form of renewable energy used to produce the electricity's so the UK's electricity supply. So what's the main form of renewable energy that we use to produce the UK's electricity supply? Is it hydro, solar, wind or biomass? 
Okay, what do we think? So A, B, C or D. If you're watching on catch up, then pause. So we're going for wind in the chat window. Let's see if you are correct. It is wind, well done. That's why we keep seeing those offshore wind farms popping up everywhere. Okay, question four. Identify the form of energy which can be extracted using the process of fracking. Okay, A, B, C or D. Is it bitumen, oil, coal or shale gas? So it should be nice and easy. We've just talked about this one. So I'm just going to give you a moment. Okay, so we've got a D coming up in the chat window. Well done. And it is shale gas and our last MCQ, which type of energy makes use of uranium? So is it nuclear, hydro, biomass or solar? What do we think? A, B, C or D? So which type of energy makes use of uranium? OK, so what the answers coming up in the chat window, A seems to be our favourite answer. X and it is nuclear. Well done. Excellent. So if you go to the tutor to you website, you will find all sorts of additional resources there. There are some brilliant flashcards. There are some excellent um, revision MCQs, all sorts of things on there. So do take a look. We've also got some um, workbooks coming out at the moment as well. So worth having a look there. And thank you for joining us and well done for keeping with us. If you've been with us for uh, 50 odd minutes. <laughs> Oh, well, I mean, we've packed so much in there, haven't we? We have. So much. What a fantastic session. I feel like Another it. fantastic session. No. <laughs> no, I mean, it's been amazing. I, I must admit, I was, I was gripped by that. I mean, particularly the stuff about water security and, and minimising. Mm. I don't know whether I told you, Vicky, Suzanne, but, but I've, been, uh, I've been having a lot of nightmares about how much water I waste. Uh, anyway, I've mentioned it to the doctor, and he says I'm having flushbacks. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Oh, that's what like, mate. <laughs> if I could, if I could reduce my water usage, I guess I'd be flush with success. But we'll see. We'll see what Would happens. Be. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> uh, that was fantastic. What yeah. killed the water? I mean, that's an amazing place. If you ever get a chance yeah. to visit kill the water, what a beautiful part of the world, and so quiet and so so full of water. But I mean, it's an amazing part. If you can get in the middle of nowhere, but <laughs> indeed, yeah. yeah. But it really is something special up there. If you can get there, because of course it's in an area where a lot of the uh, the energy has been um, has been removed from, uh, due to, to the, due to the storm. Yeah, it's still, yeah, so it's still really there, isn't it? Well, that is fantastic. It's been an amazing term of live GCSE revision sessions, and amazing, particularly because of the work of Vicky and Suzanne, and Shanique, and and the rest of the team. Everyone, the rest of the team who've worked hard behind the scenes. Great sessions put together. I know we've seen massive numbers on the replay and catch up yeah. um, on, on YouTube. And I'm sure as we get into the mock season, as we get towards the exams, even more students will find these useful. So I do, right. do remind you, I know Vicky and Suzanne always mention it, but if you go to tutor2.net forward slash live and pick the only option that matters, GCSE geography in the replay yeah. section. <laughs> uh, I think we've got must be 20, 25 sessions, maybe, maybe even more. Yeah, loads. Um, really a lot now. It's with, along yeah. with the revision blast, there's, there's tons Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So make the most make the most of it, and of course, please do leave a comment in the in, on the YouTube channel. Um, and we'll as long as it's nice. It. Well, of course. <laughs> uh, if it's saying. not, then don't leave it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, and also don't forget, whilst you're there, don't forget to press the thumbs up button or the like on YouTube to help uh, yeah. this, this these amazing sessions uh, get recommended to other GCSE geography students as they as they take on the challenge of some some mm. difficult exam papers in the summer so anyway mm -hmm. massive thanks uh we hope that you have a a really enjoyable festive break from vicky and suzanne yeah. and i am yeah you deserve Happy to put Christmas. your yeah <laughs> we are back in in next half term in 2022 and we're going to tweak the format of the sessions uh i mean we were just chatting earlier probably looking mm -hmm. a bit more around sort of exam technique short answer questions yeah. application that kind of stuff yeah. Um, so leave it with us. We'll come up with some great activities and uh, hopefully you'll find those useful. But for now, Excellent. for the end of 2021, a uh, huge thanks to you all. And, uh, well, see you later. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>